Sustainable Mobility Next Moves. That is the title of our panel, and it is a great pleasure to introduce our speakers. And I begin with Fatima de Gloria. She is Vice President of Sustainability at the Air France KLM Group. Great to have you with us. It is also a pleasure to welcome Angelika Huber-Strasser. She is Managing Partner at KPMG Germany with responsibility for the southern region of the country where some of this country's biggest automotive firms are located. And Katerina Tomov is Senior Vice President of Environment, Social and Governance at DHL Supply Chain. And we're joined virtually by Andrea De Bane. She is former head of global sustainability at the Switzerland-based logistics giant Kuna and Nagel. So great that you could join us remotely. I'd like to begin, first of all, with asking all of you to give us your assessment of where the sector stands now and where you see the biggest challenges as well as the biggest uh, opportunities and also most promising technologies. And is, if, I, if I may, I'll start with logistics and start here with you, uh, Katerina, and then go to Andrea. Companies like DHL are operating at the very nexus of the transport challenge. You're heavily dependent on air and sea. Both are hard to abate uh, modalities uh, in transport. And um, I'd like very much to hear what that means for you, what kind of challenges that's posing. OK, well, you mentioned some of them already. Um, I would say overall, maybe before I go into the modes of transport, I think the challenge is that the time is running out. So um, we really need to act now. And I know that you read this everywhere, but it's true. Um, we've said that 10 years ago, and now 10 years have passed. And if you look at the development, yes, there has been technological progress. But um, the challenge I see is that the, technolo the, the technological progress cannot replace one-on-one -on -one how we've done it. So you cannot say, oh, we keep growing, we keep moving things around, um, and there's just a cleaner technology. That's not the case. So the challenge is that, A, we need to accelerate the technologies, and then what comes with that, obviously, also everything around it. So if we look at air and ocean, you said it correctly, there's not that much to replace it. Um, we have invested in air as our biggest footprint. We've invested in an electric vehicle, uh, electric airplane, which the first one flew. And there are 12, 13 more in the order, but we're talking 12, 13 airplanes. That's, it's a good start, but it's not gonna change everything to zero. And uh, to my knowledge, also DHL holds the biggest share of sustainable aviation fuel in the whole industry, including all air carriers. And still that will not bring us to zero. So I think air re really remains a challenge, but I'll, I'll keep a part, part of that for you. But if we look at the overall logistics footprint, road actually has a higher footprint than air, if you look across the industry. And there I can just say, we, what do you need? You need availability of technology, then you need the infrastructure, and then you need it at a decent price. We don't even have the availability yet for heavy duty vehicles. Mm -hmm. So in DHL, we opera operate around 120,000 vehicles globally, of which if we look at electric, which many people have in their mind, around a fourth is electric, but these are vans. So all the heavy duty vehicles are mostly still running on diesel and we're trying pretty much everything gas, HVO, or biogas, HVO, um, and electric, but there's only a handful. So I think there, we're not even, we don't even have the technology available. I was on a panel last week with some OEMs, and I said, the biggest thing is we need, we need the vehicles to drive. Because about 10 years ago, we were in the same situation for vans. I said, we now have a fourth of our 120,000 um, electric. Back then, it was the same situation. We didn't have them, and we built our, we were so <laughs> desperate that um, we built our own electric vehicles. I think maybe some of you might remember 
street scooter and mm -hmm. it really helped and I think it also pushed the manufacturers but we, I don't think we can do it for heavy duty vehicles, I'm <laughs> sorry. So huh. we're really reliant there on the OEMs to accelerate. Thank you for that very frank look at some of the challenges. I will go over to Andrea to ask for your take uh, whether Kuhn and Nagel undoubtedly facing some similar challenges, but maybe you also want to add a few things. Yeah, sure, thank you. And um, <clears throat> pleasure to be with everybody, even though it's virtually. Wish I could be there in person. Um, I think Catalina talked a lot about the actual technologies and the assets. So Kuninagel is actually very asset light. And I think the challenge for us, if we looked at our uh, CO2 emissions, 98% of our CO2 emissions is in scope three, which means it is um, the transport of our customers freight uh, together with our suppliers that um, is, uh, is the biggest emitter or the biggest uh, part of the overall company's um, uh, footprint. So what it means for us, the, the challenge there is really working differently. Um, it means that we have to have a very different approach with customers. We really need to understand their footprint. Uh, we need to be able to support them um, guide them, advise them on what the opportunities are in the immediate um, sense to be able to avoid or, or to reduce until those new technologies are available uh, in the market. It also means a different way to work with suppliers and really having, um, you know, engagement with suppliers. Uh, collaboration agreements uh, so that we can really understand and push our suppliers as well to be at the forefront to either adopt new ways of operating, adopt new technologies, help to incentivize them. So it's really a collaborative effort. And the business model, that means needs to change. So if you look at freight forwarding, it's short term, it's transactional. And all of this means that these new ways of working means new strategic partnerships with the suppliers and the customers. And it also means working collectively with customers um, together. So, you know, Kuna Nagel has over 400,000 customers. That's a lot of data. What we try and do is really pool that data, be able to provide the data and use it um, to the benefit of customers so that they can make the best choices for themselves in terms of route planning. It might mean, you know, a change in um, modes of transport. Uh, it also could mean working together collaboratively with um, other peers in their own sector for co-loading opportunities, uh, et cetera. And of course, being able to benchmark, that's really interesting for the customers. They want to be able to benchmark against their own peers in their sector or even across sector. So I think the, the use of data um, and the data insights is really very important uh, as a lever that we can act on immediately um, while we wait for new technologies and more low carbon fuels uh, to become available and uh, accessible to the market. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. And I'd like to go over to Fatima now, if, if I may. And air transport, we touched on this earlier uh, today. Air transport, you almost, uh, you're getting used to hearing the modifier hard to abate uh, in conjunction with air transport now because it's, uh, it's cer certainly in the context that I work in, uh, the two just seem to go together. Now I know that you, Air France KLM, as one of the largest European airline groups, you are testing sustainable aviation fuels. You're also doing a lot of thinking about hydrogen. Can you tell us what you think will be the fuel of choice in future? Uh, thank you. So indeed, um, I, I still wanted to come back to an earlier point um, that Catalina made, and that is that uh, 2050 is going to happen very fast. And we need all of your help, because if all industries think it's OK to take a little bit more time, uh, the three of us or the four of us as we're here, we're going to be at the end as hard to abate sectors. So the more uh, you use up the carbon credits, the less uh, we keep for, uh, for the rest of the industries at the end of this cycle. We're also getting a lot of the heat. 
So a lot of the criticism is focused because we have large customer bases, so we also take a lot of the attention. Um, and indeed, we are very much dependent on others to um, decarbonize. So um, this morning there was a discussion already about the technologies that are available, uh, but they are going very slow. Electric flying is not going to save the world. Um, hydrogen planes, so flying on hydrogen directly, will become available maybe as of 2040, 2045, but maybe on the regional to medium haul, let's say Europe, but it's not going to solve the long haul um, flying. So to that point, um, the solution that is directly available is sustainable aviation fuels. However, today, uh, the production of what we call SAF is 0.025% of the global fuel mix for aviation. And we, in last year, we used 0.6%, which, as you can imagine, is a big feat, but it's nothing for the moment. So imagine you have seven plants of SAF today, and by 2030, we need to reach around 300 plants all around the world. That's a huge effort. And it's an effort that, as an airline, we cannot do all by ourselves. It's, it's not possible because sustainable aviation fuels, when they are coming from organic matter, biomass, they're about, let's say, three to four times as expensive as kerosene. And when they are made of e-fuel, which is a less mature technology, it means you use CO2 and water um, and renewable electricity. Those two together, you make hydrogen, so hydrogen with CO2 becomes uh, electric fuel. That one is about five to eight times the cost of, of kerosene. So how do you deal with that? So what we have been doing is introduce a multiple of uh, programs. Uh, here again is where you can, uh, can come in because um, companies uh, like Kuhne and Nagel uh, that have business travel have a scope three uh, using aviation. Uh, and through our program, and uh, there are more airlines, by the way, that have this, you can participate in upscaling the use of SAF. So it means that you come a little bit out of the chicken and egg discussion, because it is expensive now, but the more you scale it up commercially, mm -hmm. the more accessible it becomes. And the more businesses participate in it, uh, the less it needs to go to the cost of the final end consumer, because we also want to keep flying accessible. It should not go back to being um, yeah, something for the elite and something for the rich and for the jet set, uh, we even have a word for it, the jet set uh, <laughs> uh, way of living. It should not be that. Flying gives access to education, to health, uh, there are 13 million citizens in Europe who are working in a different member state than where they are from. That too brings uh, mobility, not only from flying, also from trains, but this need for mobility, uh, it continues to grow and we need to go and move to cleaner solutions as fast as we can and everyone can contribute. Thank you. We'll come back to the, the uh, point that you mentioned about cooperation and dependence on others a little bit later on. But let me go now to Angelica. And German car companies were long viewed as laggards when it came to going green. Uh, do you think they have caught up now? And what gets you most excited on the one hand and most concerned on the other hand? Um, I think they've heard the bell ringing, so I think they're all in the middle of a transition. And, but what we see at the moment is that they are in a perfect storm, what we are seeing. They're in the middle of the transition from combustion engine to e-mobility. On the same um, time, they also you know, have to be open to technology like uh, hydrogen cars. So they, they also have to do a lot of uh, still research and invest money into, into this new technology. And on the other hand, we see at the moment a lot of regulation going on. So they are still very regulated. And what really um, worsens the thing is they're a very global industry. So they produce worldwide. They have supply chains worldwide. And we see at the moment very, very um, uh, volatile uh, supply chains. So they also have to deal with the transition of their suppliers, even in the light yeah. that they have not to be discussed it this morning to decouple, you know, then they have the issue where do they get the batteries from. We know that, for example, lithium, uh, 
95% of, of the basis of lithium is produced in China, so they see also the risk, how can they become independent from, from battery technology from China. Um, so, and we also see the social implications, we see a different behavior in people, so people don't want to own cars anymore, they want to share it. So they are really in the middle of the perfect storm and yeah. they have to you know, react to all these challenges at the same time, which costs a lot of money. And um, not all, I think not all of the, even the smaller OEMs in Germany, like uh, BMW or Mercedes, they have at the end the resources then, you know, to stay in all technologies. And also the autonomous drive is a very big threat to them because there are new entrants coming into the market like Apple and Google, they're thinking about, you know, building up also their own cars. So they are really facing a lot of challenges and, um, and also sustainability is very top of their mind. Let me ask you about the internal combustion engine because those German supply chains are very much dependent on what goes under the hood. And uh, for years now, we've been hearing a lot of concern about jobs disappearing as this shift is made toward electric vehicles. Do you think in 10, 15 years, we will still have internal combustion engines? Uh, certainly, there's been a push from the industry to keep various technologies in play, but where do you think this is heading? I think in Europe, we will see that we, we will go away from combustion engines. There will be combustion engine cars and, and trucks all over the world still available. It's, you know, we, we have a, a very strong view on, on the US and Europe and in China, but there is still the rest of the world, like India, like Indonesia, like Brazil. We won't see uh, that they are moving in the same speed to e-mobility like China or Western Europe or the, or the US. So, and where, whether we see the, still the production of combustion engines in Europe, I think they will go away, but we see a kind of movement of deindustrialization in Europe anyway, due to the fact that US is very attractive at the moment, and we also know from the production of cars, you know, for example, BMW lost the support for subsidies in the US market for e cars. Uh, Volkswagen at least made it that they, one of their e-mobility cars who are produced in the US will qualify for the subsidies. So we, we will see different movement, and I think we will see some, you know, deindustrialization uh, of, of even our automotive industry from Europe into China, into Brazil, and also into the U.S., which means that we will lose these jobs. So all of you have described a lot of disruption, a lot of uncertainty, and um, a lag that we're not where we need to be. So let me ask all of you to speak uh, a little bit about next moves. What is most crucial to get the sector on track uh, to the degree uh, that you think uh, that can be uh, met to meet net zero goals by 2050. And um, let me ask particularly about hydrogen because there's an ongoing discussion, not only in Germany, but also here. Uh, you could even call it uh, an ongoing beauty contest uh, in the automotive sector between e-mobility and hydrogen and um, you hear proponents of um, hydrogen saying at times that uh, hydrogen should be saved for hard to abate sectors uh, like air, like shipping, like heavy freight. Uh, you guys are nodding, but you do sometimes hear those in the car industry saying, no, this should be a technology neutral uh, debate. So let me get all of you to weigh in on that for starters. Katerina? Well, if you look at it chemically, it's clear that for road it's not the best use of energy. Having said that, we also heard that it's, there are not that many options, but I think we as DHL, we don't have an opinion to say it should be there or it should be there. We just want to move forward. Um, but I, I would say if you look at the, at the chemical process and where there is best use of the energy, electric has a better ratio of um, use of the energy for roads. So there is actually at least a, an alternative. But having said that, we would also drive hydrogen trucks if, if they're there and the infrastructure is there. For us, it's really 
to reduce and to get out of that chicken and egg and these the regulation needs to do something, the OEM needs to do something. We need to decide, we just want to move to show that we can do it. And I agree, same as Kühn and Nagel, we have a lot of scope three, so 80% of our emissions are scope three. And I, I agree to what you said, I, I, it's, it's a big challenge. At the same time, I put the emphasis on our own assets because I believe as a huge player, you need to show that we want to act and we we will do what is needed. And of course, then we also need to bring our subcontractors along. And let me go over to Andrea also for your view on that. Uh, yeah, well, actually, before I worked at Kunanagal, I was 17 years with Airbus. So I know very well the aviation industry. And uh, I think that the last drop of fossil fuel will probably be used on an aircraft. So uh, <laughs> I think there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of com complexity to find new transformative technologies for um, long haul and uh, as Fatima said, cross uh, Pacific and cross Atlantic uh, air freight. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, these technologies need to be tested. They need to be certified. Um, they need to be, um, the infrastructure needs to, to be put in place. And then companies, airlines need to adopt that technology and scale it. And all of that takes time. So um, I think if you look, and I think things like um, sustainable aviation fuel or any type of, uh, let's say, low carbon fuels should probably be prioritized for aviation because there is no other alternative and there won't be for many, many years to come. We know that hydrogen um, and that most of the shipping vessels can actually be retrofitted to uh, half fuel cell and hydrogen technology. So it does make sense. And if you look at the new uh, vessels coming in, that that would be say, you know, the midterm. Um, and so there's an opportunity there. Nevertheless, there's a lot of money that's going into hydrogen um, technology. And there's a big initiative, it's called Clean Aviation out of Brussels. It's the largest uh, public-private um, partnership that's there. And I think it's about pooling R&D across sectors so that all transport sectors and even industrial sectors can benefit. And actually, when there's an opportunity to adopt a new technology, I think it's really important to get it out of the market and to test yeah. because there's so much uncertainty in different pathways. And we need to test the different pathways, absolutely, right across all the uh, transport modes. Thank you. And I'll just jump over to Fatima, if I may, uh, to talk a little bit more about that point and combine it uh, with an additional one. We often hear that this market, uh, hydrogen has to be upscaled to really have uh, an effective uh, market, which would argue for more sectors using it theoretically. Um, so last year, the uh, President Macron and the Prime Minister of the Netherlands uh, got together to establish a public-private innovation pact focusing on development of hydrogen-powered aircraft and, interestingly enough, hydrogen hubs at airports because the infrastructure piece is so very crucial. Can you talk a little bit about what the priorities should be there? If you were advising the two of them about how to get this off the ground, as it were, um, so, I, I'm very happy with everything that was said already. Um, the one thing you need to know about hydrogen is that you need electricity. And that is the question that is really behind. So, it's not that um, we're, as aviation, saying, oh, you know, we shouldn't have more sectors use hydrogen. Yes, of course. Uh, it is a really good alternative if your country was based on gas to switch to uh, hydrogen because it uses the same infrastructure. It's really an area of innovation. But let's not forget we're on a clock altogether. We have a deadline and it's ticking and it's coming uh, more forward rather than more back. And the question of electricity is not solved over day, over day, uh, overnight. So to the same uh, gentleman, I would say 
invest in your infrastructure. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands, we have companies who want renewable energy and who cannot be connected to the grid because nobody foresaw that they would need more capacity on the electricity grid. How is that possible? Um, at the same time, we, uh, we have discussions in this country about, uh, oh, we need electricity, but there are certain types of electricity that we don't like. Um, let's keep it there. Um, mm -hmm. If we want to have those discussions, then um, how do you want to have this acceleration of hydrogen? And we know that hydrogen is required, again, not only for aviation, you need it for multiple sectors. If you start putting the figures all together of how much energy you need, which in principle is limitless, and the sun is shining every day for free. Uh, in the future, you will have fuel or solar cells on every window, on the backpack, in your clothes. It will be everywhere. So electricity longer term is not going to be the issue. The issue is how do you capture that energy in time to make that transition? And that is you know, the, big, um, the big question that we're not answering is how do we accelerate that generation of renewable electricity? Mm -hmm. With that also comes concerns of locations. I already mentioned we need 300 plants just by 2030 of sustainable aviation fuels, not only hydrogen and e-fuel, but also uh, biomass. Where are they going to be located? Which areas are going to be designated? Because it cannot just be anywhere. They need to be in certain places that are close to certain industries, otherwise you're just wasting um, you know, you're just wasting the, 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 um, the transport. Or you put them in strategic locations in other countries where you have good pipeline systems. Uh, could be close to Europe, but not in Europe. Uh, so you could have hydrogen produced in a certain country and have it transported to Europe. All of this requires strategic thinking, and that's where we opened uh, uh, the morning. Where and how would we build that type of relationships where, uh, as Europe, we would become less dependent on today the oil producing countries and we create that partnership and that infrastructure uh, independently for Europe so that we can indeed accelerate that transition. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Angelica, you kind of weighed in on this point already when you talked about uh, electric vehicles, but let me just ask you, because I do have my eye on the clock and there's not a lot of time left on it before we go to audience questions. If you were advising the German, but also the European uh, Union, a uh, German government and the European Union, about top priorities for where they need to be investing and for what frameworks they need to be putting in place to ensure that there is a viable automotive industry in Europe in future. What would your absolute top priorities be? I totally agree with what, what you said, Fatima. I think the first thing is we have to be clear how we produce the energy we need, regardless whether we need the energy for batteries or whether we need the energy for hydrogen. We need the energy to produce these kind of fuels for, for our industries, for our plants, for our households, and for our cars. And I think we have not a common understanding. You know, it doesn't make sense that, you know, we switch off nuclear power plants and, you know, then we buy nuclear energy, for example, in Germany. Um, th there are, you know, still assets there who would be viable to use what we are not doing. But we have, at the moment, we have not a clear strategy how Europe is going to produce energy in the future and how, what's the need and what's the infrastructure. And I think the other one, to coming back to the geopolitical issues, solar is a big thing, but we should know that, you know, the main panels and everything, 90% is produced at the moment in China. If, like we discussed this morning, we have the Taiwan war or, you know, dissents or what, whatever it is, and they stop sending solar panels to Europe, that's, that's the end of our, you know, uh, renewable en energy strategy. So I think we are not, and the Europeans, we should be clear enough how we are going to produce energy, and then we can do the next step. But, you know, we try now, like you said, it's a chicken and egg thing, you know. We try to force the industry to produce the products, but we are not sure how we are going to run them. And I think these are two points of an equation, and if one is zero, the industry can have the best cars. If you don't have the energy to run them, they will stand still. 
Thank you very much. Let's go now to audience questions. I've got two on my iPad, and then I want to take some from the room as well. And on the iPad, this is one I think uh, largely for you, Andrea. Um, working together collectively, you talked about uh, working with your customers and suppliers and so on. Across clients, partners, and vendors is great, but how do you enable data sharing? Very often this is something that is core to companies, but with a low willingness to make data insights available. Yeah, that's a great question. We obviously need to get, um, we keep our, we can share data and keep the um, customers anonymous. But first of all, we need to make sure that there's a customer group that wants to work together. So I can talk concretely uh, about the healthcare sector because the healthcare sector got together and they actually approached us and said, look, we really want um, to decarbonize and, and work more towards more sustainable uh, supply chains. What can you do for us? And we got their agreement. They were willing to share the data on um, the basis that it would be kept anonymous per customer so we could look at it aggregated, disaggregated, and look for opportunities so that they could also understand where they stood among their peers, but also, as I said, look for opportunities for green lanes, for co-loading, um, sharing best practices. So that's where it has to start. So we can't impose this on any customer, but it has to come from the yeah. customers and really understanding which sectors are more willing um, and are uh, willing to take that, that step. So that's, that's what we're doing. And I'm going to go to Katarina with a related question that's also come in from the audience. How much change can be achieved through behavioral change from customers, uh, like getting their DHL package only delivered? Not quite sure what that means, but you do have green windows, don't you? That, you know, I can choose uh, which, which package I, or which, which mode I want uh, when I get a delivery. Okay, just very briefly before I come to that, I think the data sharing and that people don't want to share data will remain in a way, but it will also end because in order to make decisions, you need data and you need joint data. And I already see that there are a lot of platforms, mushrooming, that offer the neutral, to be the neutral party, so you share your data with them we get the data from them, they host them, then there's direct data sharing. So I think the whole data thing, I agree, is gonna really be one of the levers to change things. And it's something that, that will happen one way or the other. Coming to the customer and the consumer, I'm very glad that question was raised because I was afraid we would exit this stage without an appeal to the customer because it's very easy to say regulation should be doing this, the Europeans are not really sure about what they want. I'm not saying I disagree, but um, the, the buying power, I mean, we're all profit companies, so we get paid by customers. That's where we make our money, and if a customer says, I want this differently, then that is a big power to decide. And I can tell you, um, we still have customers where we offer to drive on alternative um, vehicles and they prefer us to drive diesel if it's a bit cheaper. So then it's upon us whether we say, okay, we carry that extra cost and we do that, but we cannot do that for everyone because at some point our margin is gone. So I think that it's a very important part that the customers and the consumers play to really make a conscious decision. Who do you want to reward your business? And if you are a business, um, then to say, okay, do you have it in your tenders? Do you have sustainability criteria in your procurement processes? Many don't have that. It comes as an afterthought and uh, it comes after price and everything else. And then, okay, by the way, if you have three slides on your sustainability program, that would be appreciated. That's not how we're gonna change it. Thank you. Who in the room has a question for our panel? Am I, I'm missing, yeah. Um, thank you for the for this uh, very um, exciting uh, explanations. 
I would be interested in learning more of what your concrete suggestions are um, on how industry could become less dependent on others. So you just mo made the example of uh, us being dependent on solar panels being delivered from Taiwan. So what are your strategies in this regard? I think this is a very uh, important question, and I think this also the Europeans have to to ask themselves. You know, what industries do we want to have back, or near shore, or French shore? And I think it's not that easy because in the last 25, 30 years, we have done the opposite. You know, we have really divided up our, all the the supply chains. We we've always looked where it's cheaper. We also have. Um, you know, try to do single sourcing because it's much cheaper due to scale, um, economies of scale. And now we observe that, you know, we have to be more resilient and we should all be aware that this costs money. And th the thing they have to do is that we have to, you know, think really back, you know, what industries we are, you know, bringing back, you know, we are near shore and also that we uh, give up um, this paradigm of uh, single sourcing and which also means that at the end of the day we will see higher costs. But this is the only way that we get more resilient supply chains and that we also become more independent from, you know, for example, from China. Anybody else want to weigh in on that question? Uh, we do have, we are seeing the EU shift to a more uh, proactive industrial policy stance. They have these important projects of common European interest where there's a lot of funding uh, going into things like, I think, batteries and uh, other technologies. Chips. And Yeah, chips. Anybody want to talk a little about that? Well, just maybe completing the example you gave of uh, innovation sectors, I do think that that is, um, that is a start of that conversation. So understanding where do we want to make a difference and how are we going to make that a long-term decision, um, I, I do think that when, uh, when we all start gathering together, so not indeed only depending on governments, but every single one of us playing our role, becoming part of alliances or consortia where we're all coming together to work on that, then we can all contribute. So uh, yeah, I, I like the question, how can we all make our part of that, it's really in the innovation and moving forward with that. Thank you. And I would say the innovation and then follow it through. I think we have some innovation. If you take solar, we had solar a solar industry in Germany. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm based in Bonn. We had a huge solar industry there and it, it's gone down. So I think it's also following through and really making taking a stand. Um, as a logistics company, I would always say invest in infrastructure because you can just look at yourself. The world is not so complex. If you want to change to a cleaner vehicle, you need to fuel it somewhere. If there's nothing where you can fuel it, you will not buy it. At the moment, for electric vehicles in Germany, the fueling structure is zero for heavy-duty vehicles. We do not have a single fuel station, if you want, for an e-van, if we uh, for an uh, e-truck, if we wanted to drive one, so the biggest infrastructure for DHL are our own buildings where we fuel them. That's the only thing that exists. So, oh. I would say if we really want to change things, infrastructure would be one of the key things. Thank you very much. I'm a very short. Sure. So France has um, met much of its um, needs uh, with nuclear. And I know the nuclear is a no-no uh, for many uh, people. Uh, but you mentioned, Fatima, that electricity will be very critical for hydrogen components. So what is the prospect of nuclear in this equation? We're not in the energy panel, I don't know. Uh, so it's, it's not that I know the answer myself. Um, we can link it to hydrogen if you yeah, want, on, because on there's a, a big discussion level? about blue, green, pink, gray. Yeah. <laughs> on a personal level, um, I understand the difficulties with nuclear. Um, it's more that if I have to choose between bads and bads, you know, which bad is worse? 
so, so that's a little bit the dilemma. And in that respect, we do have a really urgent uh, problem to solve. Um, can we maybe put the other problem a little bit later so that we solve one problem before we answer to the other problem? So, but again, that's a little bit on the personal level uh, because it is a very hard discussion to have. I think we'll have to leave it there in order to sort of get back on time. So many, many thanks to our panel for this very interesting discussion.